All right, let's do it live on a Monday edition of Cleveland Browns Daily. Merely Bo, and joined by the voice, the great Jim Donovan here with me in studio. How are you, sir? How are the ponies most especially? I am good. I was with them earlier this morning. It is a good day to be a horse, <laughs> and especially a horse at the Donovan Ranch. We get it's like a some good day. oats. Do we get nice and look good hay? How it's do we look? A, at- no, it, we have beautiful. We have beautiful pastures. I have to say, oh, we have beautiful gorgeous. pastures, and so um, you know, they, we have beautiful blankets. So I mean, they go out, <laughs> they come back in, and they're well treated. It's a good day. That's a good they day. They have runouts once they get in. Yeah, a you lot know, of wins. It's like a JW Marriott there. <laughs> <laughs> it really is out there uh, at the Donovan Ranch. It is great to see you, sir. Look, this is a pretty wild thing in that you have free agency starting officially on Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Right. But the business is happening, and the business has been happening all weekend. We were involved in some business reportedly. I'm just going to put one blanket reportedly out right now. Everything so is reported. Everything today. that we yeah. are going to talk yeah, about is, is reportedly – you can pretty much use replace – this is me. You can replace reportedly and ignore it the rest of the way because this is what's happening in the league because this is stuff that's coming from agents, right? And so it's an awkward spot for us, <laughs> but it's all reportedly. But there aren't many instances where a reportedly doesn't end up being factually by Wednesday at 4. No. It's a lot of fun. It's pure and joy. Once again, it's the NFL – becoming a 365 day a year news cycle yeah. i mean really they they might take a week off maybe not but i mean they might take a week off but then all of a sudden right after a super bowl which now is in february yep i mean you're you're in indianapolis as you and nathan were yep. and you're down at the combine and then this date hits and this is when it really gets rolling and then the next thing you know guys are coming in for the off-season conditioning program and the camp segment begins it's, Which is amazing. It is. Our business, um, the tel- the power of television, uh, something that, that you've been in mo- most of your life, I was in most of mine, um, we set the calendar, and the NFL, when it launched the NFL Network, was pretty smart to say, hey, we- let's find a way to make sure we have some programming here. Right. Yeah. So these things weren't a big deal 15 years ago. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have had this day in March. You wouldn't have had uh, the Combine play out the way that the Combines right. played out. But because you have a network to feed – then it's nice if you can have a 365 business. And this is the most popular sport in this country by a 1,000 miles. It, its feeder system is now second. College football has now become the second most popular sport in this I country. I agree. I agree. Uh, from a rating standpoint. So not only is it the most powerful, but its feeder system is the second most powerful. Bo, I have to tell you, back in 1999, yep. when the Browns were coming back and they had boatloads of money to spend on, on guys to commit and make up – You know, which was a very, very lean roster. But at that time, I used to sit outside the Blue Point restaurant (laughs) in between 7 and just before 11 o'clock so I could get back and do the 11 o'clock sports on television. We would sit on a corner, me and a camera guy, and it was cold. And we would sit there because the Browns would bring in their free agent candidates, sure. and they would eat always at the corner table because the corner table was the best table for all of our listeners who have been to the Blue Point because you can look up and see the terminal tower there. And it is rather picturesque, okay? Yeah. But uh, we would sit there, and all of a sudden, there's Lomas Brown. Hey, yeah. as soon as Lomas would finish his huge meal, he would walk outside, and we would uh, get pop him with an interview. And it was it was really, those were the days that you really had to chase down free agency. Now you don't have to do that. No, as it just comes across and it flows like you turn on a faucet and it just pours out. But I can remember those long nights outside the Blue Point to the point where the Blue Point would send a meal out to me and the camera guy because (laughs) they they realized that we were doing a lot of business and they were getting a lot of business because people then because we were down there and saying, hey, the Browns are down at the Blue Point tonight. (laughs) The next thing you couldn't get a reservation down at the Blue Point. It was a lot of fun. (laughs) Those were those were days. Yeah. And I was lucky enough early in my career to experience some of those where there really was truly an aspect of the local people. You could break those type of stories. Absolutely. Um, Now it's all done through a handful of national people at the very highest level. We still have some stuff. Mary Kay does a good job. Tone does some good job. You still see some stuff getting broken locally. But most of this stuff is happening at the at the league level. It's happening with Schefter. It's happening with Pelissaro. It's happening with Rappaport. From the NFL perspective, there's a couple of guys in the other sports that do all the breaking in those sports. It's usually agent-driven or it's owner-driven. It's put out on social, and everybody sees it instantly. And in those days, we could break something. I remember we just wanted to to beat the newspaper. 
Yeah, like if we could get it on at 11 absolutely. before the newspaper dropped right. the next day, yeah. then we won yeah. if we could do that. But if yeah. you didn't, then it's over. You know, I have another pretty good story that, that hits home because you know the Columbus market very well, but it, it involved Chris Spielman. Mm-hmm. So the Browns were coming into back into the league in 1999, okay? And so I think any veteran out there in the NFL realized that the Browns had a lot of money. Now, could you put up with an expansion roster? That had to be a personal decision. Chris Spielman was at a point in his career at that time where he was probably coming to the end Mm -hmm. of his career, but maybe one more payday. So a guy from Columbus at WCMH, his name was Scott Duff. He was a producer down there, and we were in connection with them. We would trade a lot of uh, interviews. We'd get Ohio State. We would give them, you know, Cavs or Browns. He called us up and said, hey, I was just at a, um, a banquet down here in Columbus, and Chris Spielman was there, and he said, boy, I'd like to play for the Cleveland Browns. He sent the interview up to us. Yeah. We led the, not just the sportscast, we led the newscast. <laughs> right? Breaking news. Sure. Maslin's own and Ohio State great Chris Spielman wants to play for the Browns. I'll be a son of a gun. The Browns saw that at that point, immediately got in contact with him. And he became a Cleveland Brown. That's unbelievable. Now, he had a very short, obviously, career as a Cleveland Brown. Yeah. You know, but it was it meant a great deal to him to come up here and at least give it a shot. Did but he, that, that's how the – you're right about the news cycle. That's how it used to work. It, wor- it worked that way in those days. Did he – was he – refresh my memory, and I did radio with Chris years ago. Yeah, that's why I, I wanted to tell you the story. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an unbelievable <laughs> story. It makes sense knowing him a little bit. Uh, but but all, then also he would do it at a banquet. He, I feel like he spends he spent the last 25 right, years Right, if, if you're a great Buckeye, don't you go to a banquet? A lot every, of banquets. A couple of banquets. How many a banquets week? do you yeah. want to do? You want to do Friday and Saturday? We'll book you. <laughs> how did he um, – How when did his injury happen? Did it happen – So, anyway, he – came in 1999 he came to training camp and there was a real great sense of excitement he had had a great NFL career and he was out on the field and he was having neck problems at that time yeah okay so the Browns are playing their first preseason game in the new stadium Cleveland Brown Stadium it was against the Minnesota Vikings it was a Saturday night and he went out there and he got dinged early in the game and was wobbly mm. coming off the field And then again, he came back, he tried it again. And I think it was another game. We played five preseason games that year because they were in the Hall of Fame game. And it happened. same thing happened. I mean, he he left and everything. And then he went out, amazingly, here on the practice field. After they had practiced a double session that day, and he went out with just like his pads and his helmet on, and he started hitting a sled. It was really kind of – it was really kind of – Wow. Cinemagraphic, I yeah. mean, you know, and he walked off and retired. That was it. That was it. Wow. Yeah, he realized that uh, he just couldn't do it, and so that was it. So he never actually played in a regular, regular game. season game with the Browns. It's funny because uh, up until recently, uh, this, this this latest run we've been in with success. Right. Up until then, I would still see his jerseys sprinkled in the stadium. Really? You would still yeah. see a yeah, Spielman yeah, jersey true. every yeah, once in yeah, a while. You'd right, see yeah. one in there. Yeah. It's just such a you know such a the connection to be a, a Maslin Tiger and a Buckeye and a Brown if you could pull it off. So uh, you still see that a little bit. Look, we've got – there's a lot going on here, kids, a ton. Um, so legal tampering started at noon. As I mentioned, a lot of business has taken place in the league over the weekend. Uh, let's get you up to date where we are. And, again, all of this is reportedly um, – Let's. I suppose we need to go all the way back to Friday with the restructure of the contract of Jedrick Wills. Uh, he underwent, of course, osteoscopic surgery in December to repair, repair that torn MCL. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wills had 13.5 of his $14 million fifth-year option tender converted to a restructured bonus, saved the Brown $10 million on the cap. Uh, we'll get to the Judy stuff in a second. We're well aware that it's happened. Um, but I wanted to ask you, because Nathan and I were talking last week about this, like <laughs> – we're at a point where we have so much money invested in the offensive line with the two guards, two tackles, yeah. one of which isn't going to play because Dewan's going to start at, at tackle, whether it's right or left. Deservedly so. And the way he played. So th- this was inevitable that there's going to have to be some juggling on the offensive yeah. line. So this buys the Browns some, some cap space. Yeah, and they need cap space. And I think there are some other big deals out there that yeah. they probably have to look at. I would think Cooper. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll have to look at it at, at reworking there. I think Chubb probably mm-hmm. what's going to happen there. I think those are two contracts that sit out there and maybe Deshaun again. Yeah. Maybe they have to do something there, but they need space. There's no doubt about it. They've, they've gotten some ward and now with wills and you know, who knows, Bo, 
you know, maybe some other tinkering and pulling and tugging with deals. But those big ones that we've mentioned are the ones that probably you would target yeah. and try and give them short extensions and get some get some more space to be able to get out and, and be competitive and get what you want once the bell rings. It's one of the things. And it's that, kind of wrong. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Not, they you guess want to be no, late for the bell. There's no Sharpie, but it's a lot of number two pencil that's being spread all over the league in terms of writing on all this stuff. Um, this is something that it, I think it's really important to understand, and we saw it play out with the Jerry Judy reported acquisition over the weekend. This front office knows its cap situation front and back. It understands how it's going to manage it. We had AB on at the comedy. He said, I'm three years out on the cap. So while people, <laughs> people will see like a cap number and they will go – Oh my God, we're over the cap. Right. They don't know what to. No, no, they're fine. They're fine. They have an ownership group that's willing to convert to immediate salary in terms of signing bonuses. Uh, that's willing to do that. That's very aggressive. This front office, not so. Not only do they know their their situation three years out, they know everybody else's. So one thing that Nathan and I talked about last week, we were going to be incredibly nimble to take advantage of a situation where someone was either dumping salary or in a spot where they did not want to do a fifth-year option on an extension or weren't sure about it. So if you look at the type of things that Andrew Barry, look at the type of guys that Andrew Barry has acquired, that this group has acquired, there's some certain things that check boxes. High first-round pick that maybe didn't plan it, pan out in certain ways, or uh, a, they love guys who played at Big State U. They love Big State U guy. Mm -hmm. They love guys who you can track all the way back to high school as four- and five-star athletes, guys who are identified early. So we even mentioned Jerry Judy by name last week. Sure. Like it, They've been circling him for two years. Um, but we mentioned him by last week from the standpoint of this checks every box. Denver's going to be punting on their season. Judy's a guy they've liked for a long time, former first-round pick. The talent is obviously there. It hasn't clicked the way that I think everybody thought it would in right. Denver. Yep. But they end up getting him reportedly, I think it was at a five and a six. It was a five and a six. Yeah. And they still have a five and a six left. Yeah. Um, well, he – I thought they were thin mm -hmm. on one side last year at wide receiver. Yep. I mean, Cooper's great and Joku is great, but I thought there was I was a you know I, I the mystery was Elijah Moore, but beyond that, it was Donovan Peoples Jones at the mm -hmm. start, and then obviously they dealt him away to Detroit. They obviously felt that uh, he wasn't going to be the guy that maybe they thought, but again, he was a six round draft choice. Um, but Tillman is. You know, he's going to have to learn the game, I think, Bo, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think there's an education process, and that's fine. And David Bell the same way, but mm -hmm. David Bell started to show some signs at the at the end of the year. And, and all of that is good. It's just that this is also, I think, Andrew Berry in the front office realizes the window is open for them right now, and they have to stay going through it because they're right there. I mean, they are a playoff team that mm -hmm. wants to make a deeper run, and to do that – you have to fiddle with things, and I always thought that they were a little bit lean on the one side. Cooper, fine. On the other side, projects. There's, and they're too good of a team, I think, right now to, to be that thin on one side with a vacancy. I think you hit the nail on the head. The sense of urgency has never been more heightened. Right. You, your best players, many of whom you've drafted, and if you haven't drafted them, you've, you've gone out and acquired them um, with, with a, a reckless abandon when it comes to acquiring talent and a dogged approach – but you have to go now. You have to. Yes. Your best players are in their prime. It's time to go. This Judy acquisition is one with very little risk, a five and a six, mm -hmm. very little risk, potentially a very high reward. We'd be remiss to not say that it hasn't clicked for him in the league. Yeah. If you go down and I, I – if you go down the list of guys that have been throwing to him, oh no, <laughs> you know that might no be a, a piece of the puzzle. Now I know there's been criticism mm -hmm. of him. You know, Steve Smith, you know, really went after him on the on the NFL Network, and there was a back and forth. Yep, there in Detroit, in Den excuse me, in Denver, there's been yeah some hey, what's up with him? But you're right, he's a guy that totally admires Amari Cooper mm -hmm. so he comes to a team with the guy that he has kind of mentored him he's fashioned himself after him he he was really enamored with him when he went to Alabama so I think that it, you know we also give guys a fresh start Elijah sure. Moore got a fresh start here Cooper in some ways mm -hmm. got a fresh start here and this is a good spot to try and reinvent yourself and at the right time too yeah and I, I think the other thing that this factors into we you know when we were doing uh what was it, Uno? Last week we did uh, kind of the free agent wish list, like the top three things. 
Um, so we, you know, we knew we know that they're going to address the defensive line. They have to, right? Obviously, in in terms of how they handle that, I'm sure they'd love to have Zedarius back, but they're going to want to add to that room and going to want to clarify what they want to do there. Running back was another one we mentioned yeah. because you know you mentioned Chubb and the restructure. We know that that's likely coming, but also Nick Chubb is coming off a catastrophic knee injury, mm-hmm. and who knows when he will be, if ever, back to what he once was. Absolutely. And you need to have more explosiveness out of that position. So that was the other one. And the, but the overwhelming one, guys, was weapons. You need to have more weapons yeah. because you have to beat the wizard down in Kansas City to claim the ultimate prize. You have to beat Joe Burrow in Cincinnati if they're healthy next year and they've got some issues of their own with T. Higgins demanding a trade today. And in your own division, you have the MVP of the league. Right. So – You've got to have enough weapons to walk into battle with any of those teams and say, hey, our arsenal's in the same vicinity as yours. So this was always it. And it's a it's a five and a six for a former first-round pick. Mm-hmm. The other part of this, Jim, that I think is really important is Ken Dorsey. So we talked about this a lot. Amari Cooper, David Njoku, can trust them. We're both big-time players. Big time. We did not have an ability, or maybe willingness, to spread the ball around to the rest of the receiving core much. Mm-hmm. When Amari was out, Elijah was really good. The Jets game. Yeah. Yeah, until he got, until got, he got concussed. Right. Right. So you've got to – I think Ken's operation and Deshaun with Kevin, all of – those guys are going to be on the same page, and we've got to start spreading the ball out a little bit more and get more people involved in the offense so we're not such a one-read, two-read offense, mm-hmm. which some of that's good because one and two reads means they're mostly open. But at the same time, we got to get some more people leading on the perimeter. Yeah, and there were times when uh, when Donovan Peoples Jones had been traded away, and so Tillman then stepped into mm-hmm. that role. There were times where, in a game, during a game, at a key point in a game, tight games down the stretch, Jacksonville, Chicago, where you really had to score a lot in those games to win those games. Uh, and in the Bears game, you're you know you really are, have a hiccup in the first half, and you're down by ten in the fourth quarter. And I would notice that Flacco and I think Watson before that would have to educate a kid like mm-hmm. Tillman mid-game about you didn't run the wrong right, you didn't yep. run the route the right way, and as you said, you you can't go into battle that way no. in really big games. If you're thinking big, and this team deserves to think big, and they should think big, um, you have to be able to go in full bore, mm-hmm. you know, with everybody on the same page and at an ability level that can match those other teams. Yeah, it's an arms race, man. It just is. This AFC, you're going to have to go through those teams to be able to do it. Um, so I love this deal. He was he was electric at Alabama. He was. Wasn't it amazing, Bo, how many great receivers have come out of Alabama in this run with Nick Saban? I mean, it's it's, it's amazing. It yeah. really is. I mean, I mean, you could. Yeah. I mean, Julio, Cooper, Julio Coop. Jones, yeah. Ridley, uh, the kid that had the tragic accident, Rugs, Rugs out in, yeah. you know, Jerry Waddle. Judy, Devontae Smith. Uh, Waddle down Waddle. in Miami. I mean, gosh, that's amazing. No, they've had because you think of Alabama, yeah. it's kind of a pounded out team. And, you know, they had great receivers. They well, really did. He really changed that program so many times down there before he stepped away this year. I think, and you you knew him certainly probably when he was defensive coordinator here. <laughs> um, what, what an experience. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and to be. Um, but his. Uh, the, the thing about that you have to, as a quick diversion here, the one thing about him that I respected the, among, I mean, I think he's the greatest college football coach of all time, but I think that the thing that's most remarkable is, is he was really a chameleon. He changed his approach offensively to fit what was happening. Their several early years, t- several times, it was right? very much a three, eight yards in a cloud of dust, right. if you will, because they had sure. big time backs. They had backs but, coming out of their but ears. Then when Kiffin got there after they lost to Ohio State in 15, he flipped. And then he went, we're going to go get the number one quarterback in the country every year. And we're going to go get five-star receivers. And they would have a Julio or a Coop, like Coop played in the 15 game uh, against Ohio State. But then they started to get all of those guys together. They had Devonta, Ruggs, Judy, yeah. all those. They were Waddle. They were all in the same group. Like the, It was just an abundance of offensive yeah. talent. So yeah. it's just a remarkable job to be able to stay at the top of the sport as long as he did and do it in so many different ways. Yeah. So but I hope man, that's I'll, a good connection, I, I, man. I'll tell you what, though, they had receivers coming out. I they've had picks all over the board, mm-hmm. but a wide receiver, wow, just amazing, yeah. amazing talent coming out of there. Those three, uh, I think they have some more this year coming out. 
you know, that, that really yeah. struggled a little bit because they struggled at quarterback early in the year with Milrow yeah. in and out and then finally in, but he ran so effectively. But still, Isaiah Bond and mm-hmm. Burton, I think, was the other kid. Yeah. They had some really top-line receivers that might have lost some numbers because of the hesitancy at quarterback. If you just take – imagine just the receiving – draft classes of the last 10 years at Ohio State, LSU, and Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> Those three schools. Right. I mean, that's some of the very best in the league. So Joe, Jerry Judy's going to be here. He's going to get a chance to restart his career, um, and he's going to do so with a receiving room of I, – I love the, what you brought up about Coop. I think that's huge. Like, Amari is such a leader, such a follow-me guy. Yeah. He does not – Big with words, but just actions. Right. And and I think that's going to be huge for, for Jerry Judy to be in the same room with Amari Cooper uh, next year. So that, that was the big one. Uh, we also had this over the weekend as well. Um, and there is a lot going on in the league right now in terms of, of guys moving places. Gabe Davis is a guy that we had talked about last week. From Buffalo. He goes to Jacksonville um, is the deal that gets done there. So that would tell me Ridley is out. Out, yeah is the way that that'll probably go. That just happened in the last couple of minutes. I did want to get to this, though, this Mary Kay report uh, that Joe Flacco could return to the Browns in a backup role. Um, this was a report from over the weekend that the Browns could be in the in the business of Jacoby Brissett if that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So what that tells me is they because of Deshaun's injury, it's too risky to go with, with, uh, with Dorian Thompson-Robinson as the full-time backup, that you need to have somebody. I agree. And I think we'd. Yeah, well, probably yeah. makes some sense. It sounds like Brissett's going to end up in, in New England, though, is what it seems like. Yeah, well, that's where he started. That's his first uh, yeah. his first stop. And uh, he bailed them out. At, if you remember, folks, he bailed them out when Tom Brady got the four-game suspension mm-hmm. because of deflate gate. He won a couple of games for them. Uh, and then Brady came back. And he was a good guy. I'm a tremendous guy here. Yes. But four and seven is, was the record that he had here. Um, not all his fault at all. No. But I... I would love to see Flacco back, Bo. I just yeah, I thought he was fantastic. I loved watching him throw the ball. It was <laughs> unbelievable watching him throw the ball. And I think he gave them kind of a, di- a totally different offense. I agree. I mean, just bombs away and down the field, the ability to get down the field in one big chunk, and they did that a number of times, and I think that's I think that's coming back to the league. Mm-hmm. You know, I think these spread offenses – Yep. And RPO game, I think they're there because of the athleticism of these quarterbacks coming out of the mm-hmm. college game and into the NFL. But still, there are times that when you can just get down the field in a hurry, I mean, it really makes things – it's economy. It it's, is, yeah. It's exciting economy, I think. And he is that – he's that guy. Yep. And he was just such a great guy here. Spectacular. I mean, face the franchise in a month. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty remarkable when it all happened. Uh, a couple of rules for today, guys. Um, Field Yates with this on Twitter. Teams can begin engaging with agents at noon today. That's been happening. Deals can be agreed to but not finalized. So no deal can become official until after 4 o'clock. That's on Wednesday, which I alluded to off the top of the show. Teams can speak to players who represent themselves without an agent before Wednesday at 4 p.m. Um, jersey swaps are allowed on this. So this is the Twitter thing. Uno, is that this about? So, but players can change their minds. So, no swaps are official until Wednesday at four. Is this like jer- jersey number stuff? People do like jersey swaps where they put like the Russell new Wilson jersey. and the Steelers. Yeah, stuff like you. that. Wow. So, you are allowed to do that. But oh, remember. teams can do that. Even I think so. I'll have to dig more into what Field said. I mean, but Twitter has no laws, so I think anybody <laughs> yes. can do whatever you want on that. Um, so that's that's where he's. Oh, there's Dom's out there. Lots going on. Lots going on here, kids. Uh, those are your hot topics of the day. They're presented by Vivid Seats, official fan experience partner of your Cleveland Browns. Coming up next, we're going to go through the list of everything that is reportedly happened today. Um, and I mentioned Russell Wilson to the Steelers. So we've got a little bit of that to weigh in on. Uh, some other uh, new faces and new places stuff. We will do that coming up next. The great Jim Donovan, the voice of the Browns, with me here. You listen to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
And hey there, friends. Bo here for my great friends at James B. Beam Distilling Company. Booker knows vision for Knob Creek was very simple. The embodiment of full-flavored American whiskey through age-proof and flavor to create a product that sets the standard, and they've done that. Knob Creek is created with champion those who stay true to their craft, know what they're looking for, don't feel the profession or the pressure to conform. Now through April 30th, don't forget this, take advantage, Knob Creek Steak Rebate. You get a rebate when you buy a Knob Creek bourbon plus a steak. You just upload a picture of your receipt to KnobCreekSteakRebate.com. They're going to send you 20 bucks to your Venmo right away. Must be 21 to participate. See full terms at KnobCreekSteakRebate.com. Knob Creek, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 50% alcohol by volume. 2024 James B. Beam Distilling Company, Claremont, Kentucky. Knob Creek, drink what tastes right. Lots going on. So what was interesting, Jim, last week we did like, uh, and the voice joining me here on the program today, great privilege. We, were, uh, we went through the AFC North. We had Brooke Pryor on, who does a great job at ESPN. Mm-hmm. And we pressed her on, you're really not just going to have Pickett and you're not really going to pick it at Mason Rudolph. She's like, no, that's what they're going to do. They believe in those guys you trust. And and so Nathan at one point said, well, but is that what you would do? And she's like, I'm not saying that's what I would do. <laughs> is that? And we concluded the interview by saying, well, we hope so. We hope that yeah. they stay with Kenny Pickett yeah. and stay with Mason Rudolph because there is a very hard ceiling to that. Of course, that was all subterfuge. That is not what they did at all. No. Russell Wilson will be a Pittsburgh Steeler next season. Uh, he will do so for the bargain price of about a million bucks because the Broncos are paying him 38. What do you make of Russell Wilson <laughs> to the Steelers? Well, I think it's um, you know, it I think it's surprising to me how how this guy has just kind of fallen apart talent wise on the field I mean his game really just came apart which is mysterious and it came apart in Seattle in the last year or so and then it definitely came apart in Denver and it certainly it just exploded in a bad way for him when Sean Payton came in there so I mean he goes into Pittsburgh uh I think that he will compete against Pickett it will he will have a you know a mount a, a mountain of experience over that kid and I think that the Steelers I know the general manager at the uh, at the combine, Omar Khan, said we are you know we yeah. have total faith in Kenny Pickett. Um, it will be interesting to see how they how they fashion themselves in training camp because I would think that Russell Wilson could beat him in a competition yeah. as the number two guy coming in to try and and knock off a young kid, only, if only because of experience. Well, and and that now we have never, but we have never played Russell Wilson well. We haven't yeah. played him a lot, but yeah. we haven't played him well. I mean, he kind of took us apart in Denver this year, and he did any time he uh, played against the Browns in Seattle. We just had a darn time trying to control him. We mm-hmm. never knew if he was running or throwing. Sure. Sometimes he, he did both, and he did it very effectively. But his game has it really needs to, to be put back together. So it will be interesting. He's never sat well mm-hmm. because he's never sat. No. I mean, he's a, so I don't know how he'll handle that. But I would imagine he goes in there thinking that he can beat this kid out and be the Steelers' starting quarterback on opening I, day. I, I would think very much that he's signed under the impression that he is. And, yeah, And that absolutely. I'm going to go be the starter. He, you know, the thing with him that's interesting is he's he's basically become – If you th- it wasn't that long ago it was let Russ cook, right? And he was throwing bombs to everybody, DK right. Metcalf, his rookie year, and uh, away they went. Well – what what has happened in the last couple? He's really become a check down Charlie. I mean, he is. He led the league in pass attempts within five yards of the line of scrimmage. He led the league in pass attempts behind the line of scrimmage. So that's kind of who he's become. He this is the one part that's interesting though. So they are a playoff team last year at ten and seven. Smoke and mirrors, but they do it. I I don't know how they do it, but they do it. It's yeah, nuts it's, that he doesn't really ever is. have losing seasons no, because they is. don't get. So last year, Russ was 67% completions, right around 3,000 yards, 26 touchdowns, eight picks. So Pickett, in his career, is a 62% passer. He's basically a one-to-one touchdown to interception. So while Russ isn't – Russ only threw for 3,000 yards. So, again, it's all short yardage stuff. But if a 5% uptick in completion percentage, a three-to-one touchdown interception versus a one-to-one, you win 10 games with Pickett, that's what they're banking on, right? Yes. It's right there. Yeah. 
That's yeah. it. And that's why you sign him, and that's why he went there, because he knows he's going to be better than what they got with Pickett. Yeah, because they're still all about they want their running game to be mm-hmm. their calling card, and they're going to play great defense. Yes. Now, whether or not they can continue to do that, like you and I just mentioned, somehow they do it. And they, do, they really they look dead around Thanksgiving, and then, boom, mm-hmm. they come out. The other thing about Russell Wilson, Bo, is this. I don't know that he's ever been the same quarterback since he threw that pick in the Super Bowl on the goal line against the Patriots. I don't know if that well, whole franchise has been the same since that. There was unrest in the locker room because oh of the call. They, they doubted Pete Carroll. They doubted Russell Wilson. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it can have a lingering effect. Oh, that's the throw I think that probably – it, it definitely derailed what felt like could have been a dynasty because they were all very young. Well, they're going to win two in a row. At least they're going to win yeah, two, in two in a row. row they yeah. just whipped the Broncos the year before. Right. Um, yeah, like they were in a position where they could have won two and then maybe win three. and then. But that's had, like, what started had, had a couple of 10-point leads in that, mm-hmm. in that particular Super Bowl against New England. But that one play, yes. he, you know, he'll, he'll be remembered for that, you know, throwing that pick. As They'll well, never as forgive will Malcolm Butler, who yeah. <laughs> who ended up with a ton of money because he made the play. Well, and it was interesting. I'll never. You've, that's the one where Bill doesn't take the timeout, right? Right. The clock just bleeds, and you're like, "What's he doing? He's just going to lose the Super Bowl like this?" Right. Like they're not going to make them snap it. They're not going to make him do anything. Like we're just going to lose the Super Bowl. Yeah. And then it all worked because it because it. They was, didn't hand the ball to Marshawn Lynch. It, that was it. It was amazing. Uh, and there's that great NFL Films documentary, Do Your Job, I think it's called. It's yeah. about the Patriots that year. Chad O'Shea's in that, mm-hmm. extensively in that game, uh, in that piece. And that kid Butler had had trouble with that route mm-hmm. all week long in their practice, but he mm-hmm. had seen it a lot. And the preparedness of them to be able to get, you know, just continue to harp on that kid to, you know, you're probably going to see this. And Mm -hmm. bang, he comes up with that play. But Russell Wilson, since that throw, has always been doubted, I think. Well, for sure. And then then you started to get – you saw that that was the true break of Seattle because it was the defensive guys against Russ and Pete Carroll. And inevitably, Pete got sick of him and and sent him. And it ends up being – a ransom that the the Seahawks get back yeah, yeah. from from the Russell Wilson deal. I I don't think you can. I think it's impossible not to say that Pittsburgh got better with this. They will. Oh, this yeah. is better than what yeah, they were. Absolutely. I I do think that. I don't know that this this to me doesn't change them in terms of the pecking order in the AFC North in terms of where we stand right now. Um, they're not as dangerous as we are. They are not as dangerous as as Cincinnati is with a healthy Burrow, and they're certainly not as dangerous as Baltimore is with a healthy Lamar. Um, but our guy's got to come back from injury too. Yeah. Our quarterback's got to come back from injury. So, um, and, and now this gives them competent quarterback play. This division, it's, it's going to be right back to a meat grinder. Oh, it is for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's, uh, it's exceptional, and that's why you would like to see them be able to – you really need to see Deshaun Watson play – and play a lot, okay? Yes. You just – to get a full season in and to be able to play because we are left with that memory of that amazing second half against Baltimore, 14 for 14, yep. and to win there and, and really beat Lamar Jackson at his own game. But that's – it's just been short snippets with him. It really has. For been. one reason or another. Yeah. No, you, it, that's what that's what makes – made, like, the Flacco run so magical is you you stacked a month. Yeah, you know, it was, it was four games over 300 yards. Like it was, oh, okay, like let's go. And so we need to see that from Deshaun uh, going forward. There, uh, so that happens in Pittsburgh. Perhaps some disconnect in, disconnect in Cincinnati. T. Higgins requesting a trade this yeah. morning. The tag was placed on him last week. Yeah, uh, it's 21 million, isn't it, on mm-hmm. the tag? Uh, I think that um, I think they'll play hardball, knowing yes, knowing the way they they do things down there. So that's going to be an unhappy situation. If it, if it lingers and he doesn't show up, you know, that, that really is a problem. I don't think the quarterback would be very happy with no. that. Sometimes, and in regards to him, it seems as though they, they kind of lean on him to tell, tell them what he wants, much like Mahomes yes. in Kansas City. What do you want? Who do you want? And I would think that he would make – he loves Higgins, mm-hmm. you know. And when they had all three, Boyd – Chase and Higgins, they were really rolling. That was when they made the Super Bowl run and almost did it another year. But I think that they will dig in. I think that's yes. going to be nasty. I think you have the right read on that, my yeah. friend. Knowing how Mike Brown works yeah. a little bit. That's yeah, his, that's the way Mike Brown is. That's his operation. Now, here's the thing. They've been in this position. 
I, I, I'm not going to make too big of a deal about him demanding a trade now because this is kind of the standard operating procedure of when you get tagged and you want a long-term extension is right. you demand a trade. That does not mean that he's going to be traded. Um, remember, they tagged Jesse Bates. Jesse Bates did not demand a trade, but he also didn't show up for camp. He ended up playing out his contract and then walking in free agency to Atlanta. Another example of this was Jonah Williams, who did oh, demand yeah, a right, trade. Right. He did demand a trade. They never traded him. He ended up playing out his contract, and that was fine. This is the thing for them that will be fascinating. It, it's the point you made. It's the Burrow point. Yeah. So Burrow said when he got that deal done, I want it, I want Higgins and Chase. I want to make sure that we do this in a way that those got that we're all here. But the reality is you can't have 50% of your cap on two receivers and a quarterback. True. So if they do move off of him, I think the thing down there that they're hoping for is something similar. Now, you're not going to land a type of player, but – kind of the blueprint of the Stephon Diggs move from Minnesota when Minnesota dealt him to Buffalo for a first-round pick mm -hmm. that netted them Justin Jefferson. Right. Now, are, you're not going to probably get that lucky. I don't think you're going to get that. But yeah. you may get a low first-round pick or a high two for Higgins, and that might be what they do. The question is, can you keep number nine happy if you do that? You know, the other thing about them, Bo, is I give them a lot of credit um, I think Duke Tobin does a great job down there, and I think they find receivers. Um, I'm going to kill the pronunciation of that kid, but they they found that kid from Princeton mm -hmm. last year. Yep. Uh, yep. And Yoshivas or something like that, mm -hmm. that Andre Yoshivas. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to look up the pronunciation. Yeah, anyway, I think, I think I, Yoshivas is correct. Yeah, I think Yoshivas. Thank you. Wow. There you go. Good yeah. job of you. Well, you're the voice. Yeah. Well, hey, you <laughs> know, uh, I remember practicing it like 100 <laughs> times, and then he didn't get in the game on opening day, but he did in the last game. But they find guys like that down there, mm -hmm. you know, but not to that level. I mean, they find a complimentary type of receiver. They do such a great job offensively with that roster down there um yes, but do. but i but you're right and and that will get ugly i, I mean if he if that guy he digs, digs in yeah. um that will get ugly down there and maybe joe burrow will step in and be kind of a mediator in the whole process his you ask the people down there they they the year that they circled was last year because that that was before higgins had to be tagged they they got to do this chase deal at some point. Yeah. Now he wants to wait till after Justin Jefferson, but they got to do the chase deal at some point. Um, they did the Burrow deal, um, but last year was their year. Burrow goes down, Higgins misses games, and it's done, and yeah. the season's derailed. Well, it really all fell apart that that first or second day of camp when yeah. you know he went down with that calf injury, and let's face it, he was a shadow of himself on opening day here in Cleveland. Oh. I mean, and then that defense just went after him and it was it was awful. I mean, mm -hmm. he he they had to get him out. Remember they pulled him out because just for his own health. I was <laughs> like a yeah. like they, I think they said there's no way we're going to score against these guys no. and he probably shouldn't have played anyway. No. I think he talked himself and talked them into playing. But they were up they were swimming upstream all year long and yet I thought they were going to get there. Mm -hmm. When they won that Monday night game against Jacksonville uh, yeah, it's the game where Lawrence got the high ankle mm -hmm. and then came in here the next week. But when they won that game, I said to myself, they are rolling and yep. it, and they could be a problem. Yes. If they get there. Yeah. So you you think but about then he got hurt again. And then he went down again. Yeah, and and actually, again. they actually were OK. Like Browning played OK for them, too, down this. Oh, he played pretty goodness. good when yeah. he came in. The he kid did out a great of, job out of Washington. He did a nice job. So this is all, all the reason all of this is happening. And then, by the way. Some people had mentioned maybe Christian Wilkins being a target for the Browns at defensive yeah. tackles. He signs with the Raiders. Do you have the number on that up, Uno? It's huge. Yeah, it's, I believe, five years, $110 million. What's the guaranteed? Uh, I can find that. Give me one second. That's the one. That's But I always thought he'd be too rich. Like yeah. I, You're not in the business for a $100 million defensive tackle. 84 and, and three 84 quarters guaranteed. guaranteed? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Good Lord. Uh, he, I have to tell you. He probably was helped a great deal by the Chris Jones deal getting 100%. done in Kansas City, right? Because 100%. then they could, you know, take him off the list. Not that a lot of teams probably thought he's going to become available, yeah. but they were playing the game that they, you know, he was going to go to free agency. But Wilkins definitely helped by that, you know, There's really no helped doubt. by Jones signing that big deal in Kansas City. You know, the Browns did a great job last year, a, a great job putting that defensive line together. Without really breaking the bank in under NFL standards, mm -hmm. okay. But I thought they did a great, great job. You know, Zadarius Smith, Tomlinson, 
Bo, before he got hurt, Maurice Hurst gave them some oh, great no play. Doubt. Shelby Harris played pretty well for them. I mean, those guys all came in and really did a good job for them. I commend the Browns for being able to do that because it was doing it a different way rather than going out and giving a guy $84 million guaranteed, right? For sure. And it, here's the deal. When you have Miles, you don't need to spend another 80 yeah. on anywhere else. Like, you've got Miles there. You've got Dalvin Tomlinson back. He's coming back next year. He's in the mix. You can buttress guys around him. You saw something with Oboe. I think Alex Wright down the end of the year he was did. a Alex, huge good point. He finally yeah, shined yeah, yeah. Uh, and looked good. And you I know, do think they liked Zedarius back. And we'll see what happens with Ika, you know, mm-hmm. Siaki Ika. You know, what happens there? Um, that was disappointing. Those guys really, you know, because the Browns were in contention and made the playoffs, you those guys will really get a redshirt year, for, you know, yeah. on this team. We'll, we'll see what happens there. And I think probably I, – I think A.B. is probably big game hunting still – right now out there they they probably aren't they by the acquisition of jerry judy they probably feel pretty good about where they are with the weapons but there's there's a bunch of like eric armstead hit free agency there's yeah. talk that the chargers may dump khalil Mack and joey bosa if they because of the salary cap hell they're in so wow. there are going to be a lot of teams and guys who become available who aren't not yet and I, I do think you'll see Andrew Barry get be pretty aggressive here and be in the mix on guys. There's a report this morning of being in on uh, Zach Moss, the receiver, the running back out of the Colts, Colts yeah. uh, potentially coming in here as well. So I, I think there's a lot still to unpack here. But in the AFC North, this stuff is happening. The T. Higgins stuff is happening. He's demanded a trade, and it is Russell Wilson is going to come quarterback the Pittsburgh Steelers next year. Uh, meantime, in Baltimore, it's going to be an exodus because they they got salary cap hell everywhere and they're going to have an entirely new roster <laughs> basically going forward but they still got Lamar yeah and they still got some of they got Matabuke done over the weekend so that helps them um and all of us are chasing Kansas City so that kind of sets the table of where you are in the AFC North let's set the table for the rest of the NFL through this wild first 48 hours of oh where agency. will uh, where will OBJ get his 18 million this year <laughs> he gets it every year he's gonna I'll get it what, somewhere he will get it He'll somewhere get it. I mean he keeps showing that here's my real this is the it. one-handed catch on yeah. Sunday night against I think it was against the Cowboys, Cowboys. Maybe? yeah he makes uh, and people go oh Oh my gosh! So great. Let's put him in our uniform and yeah. see if he can do that again. But he ends up with eighteen million all the time, every time, man. <laughs> that was one of those ones when it was signed. We went, really, <laughs> yeah. really, yeah, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. sure, that's gonna work out. Uh, all right, we'll go around the rest of the NFL. A lot of deals being done uh, here. Uh, the Bears very aggressive in free agency. Another defensive end off the board with Minnesota. We're waiting on Cousins. It feels like that could be Atlanta. We'll get to all of that coming up next. You listen to Cleveland Browns Daily on eight fifty ESPN Cleveland.
And don't miss Billy Joe Rod Stewart together for the first time ever. It's Friday, September 13th, Cleveland Brown Stadium. Tickets are on sale now. Visit clevelandbrownstadium.com slash Billy and Rod 2024 for more information. It's Billy Joe and Rod Stewart together for one night only. I am uh, going to that. I feel like it's going to be good. I am going to. I have seen Rod Stewart a couple of times, and uh, he's been fantastic. <laughs> he's fantastic. Do you think I would know more Rod Stewart than I think? You, yes, because I, I went right. that way. Now, I have not seen Billy Joel. And I missed him when he played at Progressive Field yeah. the one year, not too not too uh, long ago. Um, so I think that's going to be a great night. I'm very excited. I think I think my hunch is I would know more of both of those guys than I think. I think you'd be surprised that you'll know yeah. a lot of Rod Stewart. Yeah. yeah. I that ha- I went to a Mellon Camp show once uh, 15 years ago, and I didn't think I'd know much more beyond Jack, Jack and Diane. Right. And then I ended up knowing like 25 songs. Well, there you like, go. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah, everything. Yeah, you know, yeah, you, these, yeah. they're, they're used to, we used to listen to the radio all the time for the music, you know, Jim. <laughs> That's and then it was like, <laughs> you know, you didn't have this situation where everything was on demand. You didn't say play this by this. Like they just played something next. Yeah. Not always knowing what it was. And so these things snuck yeah. in. Well, I think that's going to be a fun night. That will be. Yeah, yeah. we got the Stones here this summer. Yeah. You got them both. Wow. Yeah, it's big. Um, all right, lots of news. We mentioned the news around the NF- the the AFC North. Our former quarterback Baker Mayfield getting a three year deal. Wow, in Tampa good Bay, for him, very good for him. Fifty million of that is guaranteed of a of a three year deal worth around a hundred. Very similar to the Geno Smith deal that he got with wow. Seattle a couple of years ago. So he, if you look at the quarterback slotting, I mean, he's mm-hmm. kind of middle of the road to get that deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's in the thirty million dollar range, right? I mean, not on average. And there you go. There you have it. Um, it will be fascinating to see how that all works out, if, if that is an everlasting fit for him. Uh, yeah, my hunch is they're not viewing it that way. I'm guessing they're viewing it as Mike Evans is coming back. Let's go try to win. It's a bad division. Let's try to win this division yeah. a couple of years. You're, you know that down there about that fan base. It's, it's pretty fickle. Sure, they're not the. It's not like a peer, like where oh, they're going to no, show up no, no matter what. No, like it's, it's much college, it's isn't much, it? Down yeah, there? yeah, yeah. The so other like, thing now that will become a tougher division if Kirk Cousins goes to Atlanta. That's the next part of it. Will right. be that. Um, it's pretty amazing though. Like how you remember everybody like blown away at the Mahomes deal, the ten years forty four hundred million. Yeah. Like oh my god, sure. forty million a year. Yeah. They won't be able to not do now. anything. Yeah, <laughs> not now. Now all of a sudden forty for Mahomes and thirty for Baker. You're like my god. Yeah. Mahomes is worth a hundred. It, right. on, a, on a true free market um but but that deal does get done um and so he will be back at least for they have a, an out after two years but a, a three-year deal for him and i will give him a great deal of credit for for many things you could have pecked in the you could have just packed it in i mean he played he was goes to carolina it was a mess mess yeah they cut him yeah release him Goes to the Rams has to back the, up. that one big game. Al right? Michaels on the call. Yeah, we, he was Al there. had to have money on it. He was there like <laughs> – He had to. He, he had, had like, to. He, he had so like excited. four days. I'm saying, or yeah. maybe, maybe two days yeah. to get yeah. ready, and he went in and won the game. <laughs> he did. Yeah, with the Rams. Yeah. And then that parlayed into he was fighting for the job last year in Tampa. Um, he had kind of a tip – he basically had a mirror season of his first season – of Kevin's first season here. I would agree, yeah. Pretty much. I mean, it was yeah. 64% completions and uh, 26 touchdowns, eight picks, that type of thing. He was he was terrific against the Eagles in the uh, playoff game was. that they won. I thought he was very good against Detroit. He was okay. They just didn't get it into the end zone a couple of times early in that game and settled for field goals instead. Now his offensive coordinator is gone. Yep, uh, he ended up as the head coach in Carolina. Gosh, so right. we'll see what happens there. I just always think of him as a guy that can blow up. He can blow up. Both you know? ways, right? Oh, Good and absolutely. Bad. Yeah, yeah. There's a volatility to his play. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what drives him. I will tell you this, Bo. I thought when he went to Carolina and it didn't work out there, I said, he will be on college game day. And that's he'll be he will be exceptional. Yes. You know, I saw him this year, the day of the Oklahoma Texas yep. game, the uh, you know, the Red River rivalry, and he was tremendous. Yes. But when when it didn't work out in Carolina, I thought he's gonna use the Heisman trophy. And he's mm-hmm. going to get to ESPN. He'll be on game day. And so look, I. Nick's, I didn't see Saban going there. I saw Baker going right. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly felt like that would be yeah. the way it would go. I agree with you. He was a natural ah, for that. And he um, will be when he, if, when he wants to do it. Yeah, yep, there's no question. But good on him. Uh, he gets a bunch of money there. So he will he will. Isn't stay that good that we, we still have kind of a good feeling about him? I do. I do, too. You I know, think I, I do. I thought, no one's gonna I thought he Thursday resurrected night. us, you know, from that losing – syndrome that we were in the one and 31 and just that first night that he came in and off the bench and 
Tyrod Taylor went down. He came in. He electrified that place. Finally, that place had not been – it had been, you know, dormant for a couple of years. And just that – what he did, he – Finally got that losing syndrome and flushed it out of here, I thought. I thought it was the biggest change in the feeling of a stadium that I can ever recall. Because until yeah, he went right. in, it wasn't that, it wasn't that it, th- this was anger. The vitriol in the fan base in that stadium that night against the Jets, because you're going to lose again. It was 14. Were, it was, I think it was 14 nothing. 14 wasn't, nothing. Yeah. It wasn't going well with Tyrod. <laughs> and it was like – not no more of this. Like it, it was a fed up building, and then he came in and it Boom. flipped. Yeah, like that. Yeah. And not only fourteen that. nothing, Bo, but Isaiah Crowell had done damage as a Jets. Yes. <laughs> right, there was that part of it as well. But <laughs> but going into I've that never seen going into like that. that game, I remember the town feeling they if they don't win this one, that's it. When will they win? Well, we started to look out on the calendar. Yeah, I mean, like, you're God, playing you're that lose, game. Lose, yeah, yeah. lose, lose. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I, so that's the feeling I have about him. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I have a good feeling about him. And I, he yeah. was damn good in 2020 in the COVID year. Oh, yeah. He was very good in the COVID yeah, year. He, he was. He quarterback to win over in Pittsburgh. And the, now they get the turnovers early, but was very good there. Um, he and, got, and he also engineered the win against Pittsburgh here to get them in. That's you exactly know, right. Out, yeah. Yeah. So he, I have good feelings about him, too. It's, it was one of those things where, you know, they – you, 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 why, what, why were things done the way that they were done? And I think the reason they were done is because you were chasing, you're trying to chase something bigger. Yeah. And there was a ceiling, I think. You know, and you're trying to chase down Mahomes, you're chasing down yeah. Burrow. Here's another reason, uh, and it's kind of a personal reason why I have a good feeling about him. Uh, Doug Deacon's last game mm-hmm. uh, was against the Bengals, and he was wrapping up an unbelievable uh, amount of time with the Browns, like 45, 50 years of his mm-hmm. life, you know, with the Browns. Anyway, they, they we had a little get together with his family right after the game in a suite that they had mm-hmm. that day, and he had the shoulder. Yep. And I'll be a son of a gun. All of a sudden, walking through the door, Baker Mayfield and his wife they came in to wish That's Doug great. the best. And you know what? I just thought that was great. That's big class. It was. Yeah, it really was. And it was very very heartfelt. And he got a boot out of Doug. You know going into the locker room and, and talking with them a couple of times. But anyway, I, I really that's thought that cool. was really a cool moment with him. Yeah, so I wish him well. Yeah, same. That is that is very, very <laughs> cool. Um, we have some other uh, some other things. Michael Pittman Jr. and the Colts have agreed to a three-year, 71 and a half. Those receivers deal. started to come off the board pretty quickly, didn't they? They did. Yeah, they, did. Yeah, they really did. Uh, Jonathan Greenard, he goes to the Vikings. You mentioned the Cousins thing, so I'm very curious what Minnesota's doing because they're spending in spots like this, but it looks like they're going to start over at quarterback. Yeah. Who is the quarterback going to be there? Nobody is right now, right? Nobody. So are they trying to find a way to move up in the draft? I think I think they'll be a really interesting team to watch here over the next day. DeAndre Swift signing with the Bears on a three-year 24. I love that for Caleb Williams going forward. Uh, another weapon for the Bears uh, in, in that situation. So those are some of the things that have happened around the league uh, today. We've we've reportedly made uh, one of our big moves, the Jerry Judy acquisition over the weekend. My hunch is there will be even more coming here in the next 24 hours or so. We'll keep you posted on all of that in the second hour of the program. Have a little bit of over-under as well uh, coming it up over the over the next hour as well. We continue with the great voice of the Cleveland Browns, the great Jim Donovan. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
All right, welcome back into Cleveland Browns Daily, brought to you by BallyBet, sports betting partner your Cleveland Browns, now live in Ohio on 850 ESPN Cleveland. Mayor Lee Bo Bishop, the great voice of the Cleveland Browns, the great Jim Donovan joining me. Uh, we had the Jerry Judy news over the weekend. Yeah. So fifth and a sixth, Judy comes in. From your vantage point, wish list wise, how much of a wish does this satisfy? And then what else needs to happen for AB? It was my first wish, <laughs> and it really was that they would have to get a receiver. And I uh, I really thought pick 54 would mm-hmm. be the way that they would do it. I thought the combination might be early on when free agency started, and maybe this will pan out. They would get a defensive tackle in free agency and then go in the draft, which is pretty rich yes. with wide receiver talent. And even though they don't have the first-round pick, there would still be enough talent available at number 54 that they would go that route. So receiver was the top of the list, and then, you know, Jerry Judy – is coming, and so that really answers that need. I still think along the defensive line. The Schwartz defensive line is so important Mm -hmm. with that front four because it really all happens there, and everybody makes plays off of what they do that I think that's the next thing they have to address. I always thought still that maybe linebacker was something that they need. You get kind of a two-for-one when you go get a linebacker a lot of times because you get the player – and he's playing on your defense. But then you also get probably, you know, Bubba Ventron would be happy. You get a guy that can help out on special teams. Matthew Adams was that kind of mm-hmm. signing by the Browns. Not a big signing at all, but a very useful one when he was healthy that he could go in in a pinch, play in your defense at linebacker, but was outstanding and needed on special teams. So I thought that, but definitely I think, I think you're going to have to get a running back too. We just don't know. What the availability will be with Nick Chubb at the beginning of the season. That's a real push, I think. And I know he's doing everything in his power to be ready to go by opening day. Mm-hmm. Probably by the opening of training camp. No, right? and Nick, by next week. Yeah, by, by ready to go then. But I would think that's a big ask right now. So you're going to have to really perk up that running back situation. I would think those are the things that I would be looking at. Yeah, I think you're on to it. Um, and I think, I think Judy satisfies part of it. Um, depth on the, in the middle of defensive line. Now, some of those guys could come back, like Maurice Hurst can come back. You could see some of those guys yeah. coming back on the defensive line. Um, I, I, the question I think will be interesting will be, are there any guys on this roster that potentially are traded? To, we have such depth at corner, for example. We have such depth on the offensive line, for example. Will there be trades that are done between now and the draft once once we start to get into the real league year? Yeah, well, Greg Newsom's name has been out there. Sure. Boy, I think he would be devastated if he got traded. I, would I too. think he really yeah. loves it here. And I think he felt as the year went on last year, and it's not just the interception thing that he was dry on that until he got that pick in Baltimore, and then mm-hmm. he had to play very well against Jacksonville. Um, but I think that uh, you're right. I mean, he would be a candidate. I mean, you know, if if that's if you're looking at a trade situation and where the Browns are kind of heavy, I think they're very, very good at corner, MJ Emerson. I think they're pretty happy with the kid from Northwestern. Cam Mitchell played yep. well, and I think they look at upside there. And, of course, you got Denzel Ward, and, and, and he's great. That would be one area, Bo, that you could probably take a look at that. Let me just go back to the wide receiver sure. thing. And that is – you're probably going to have to get a young receiver, though, because you have yes. a bunch of guys that I know they're good for coming in this year. But beyond that, what are they going to do? You know, is Elijah Moore going to be long term here? Yeah. I don't know. Cooper's probably not long term here. So you're going to have to start to develop your own receivers. Now, whether that is David Bell and Tillman, uh, that's a pretty long road, I think, right now. I so agree. I, I think that, you know, you probably have to use what the draft is good at, and the draft right now is really good at wide receiver this year. I wouldn't be surprised if they went again, got a young receiver to come in here. Do you remember, and I know that you do, but just for the sake of posterity and the audience's sake, uh, the Green Bay Packers when Ron Wolf was running them with Mike Holmgren, and they drafted Absolutely. a quarterback every, every single time he, draft. That was his rule. That was the rule. You always get a quarterback. Thus, <laughs> you're able to deal Mark Burnell yeah. and get get something. Yes. And I think Hasselbeck, Hasselbeck was Hasselbeck, there. yeah, they did he it over and over again. Holmgren took him with him to Seattle. The kid who was with them uh, from LSU that ended up signing with Seattle as Flynn. well. Was Matt, it Flynn. Matt Flynn. Yeah. That, did, that was did kind Matt, of Matt organiz- Flynn won a national title, he did. didn't he? Yeah, yeah. he yeah, beat the Buckeyes. But that was um that was down in the in the Sugar Bowl is at that game. But the the attitude of I think that's I get the reason I brought it up is that's where we have to be with receiver now in this league. I think so, yeah. And this this operation needs to be you need to draft one every year and hope you hit. Hit. 
Yeah. And and eventually the law of averages you will. Yeah. Um, but they they need to hit on on some of those guys. But one time I did <laughs> I did a game <laughs> uh, for NBC in uh, Green Bay when they. Uh, it was when Lindy Infante had gone okay. into, had left Cleveland yep. and became the head coach of the Packers, and they got a good run and were on their way to make the playoffs because they had Don Makowski, magic the magic man. Magic man. Yeah. And I was doing a game against Kansas City, and they ended up losing at Lambeau Field, and it cost them the playoff spot. But that, that, th- right after that, yeah. that's when they started to connect on the, on the quarterbacks. Yeah, and that was uh, – Sterling Sharp would have been on that team. Yeah. He was very, very good on those, those Packer teams, and then that led to Holmgren, and boom, the rest was history. Yeah. Um, you know, we're into free agency. I, the Packers thing spurned this in my memory. What do you remember of the – Reggie White. Oh, I remember it very well. Free agency because he was the true free agent. Free agent. Right. He went on a tour, and that's what they used to do, mm-hmm. where the player would go on a tour. Now they, I don't even think they come really mm-hmm. normally, and they let their agent do it, and they get a money figure, and then they sign it or they don't sign it. But back then, I mean, they used to really set a, a tour. He and he did the tour with his wife. Yeah. Okay. And he came to he came to Cleveland, and Art Modell threw everything, more than he had, Bo. But he threw everything at Reggie White, and they thought they had him. Okay, couldn't believe you know just said it was we're going to have Reggie White. The announcement will be coming very soon, so get set. It could be a press conference tomorrow at three, and. He, re- he thought the, the thing that put them over the finish line in Modell's mind, he bought leather coats for Reggie White and his wife and presented them to him. Really? Yeah. That was going to be the seal. That's, That's it. Seal that, yeah. Nobody came up with anything better than this. <laughs> Dinner and a leather jacket for your wife and for you. What they took you? the leather jackets and signed in Green Bay. People were shocked that he would go to Green Bay because at that time, Green Bay was not really good, although he made them good and made them great. And the other thing, there was there was a thought out there that the African-American athlete did not want to go and play in Green Bay. Yeah. You know, weather, small town, town. very small town. But I do remember the Browns and Art Modell. He was devastated when he didn't get them. Then, of course, he went on the Andre Risen search after that. That was the same. Had to go to a bank to get a loan right. to be able to sign him. And that's really, that, um, that signing and that transaction, that was when it was clear Art had to sell the team. He, you know, they were, he was broke. He's done. Isn't that unbelievable? He was broke. Yes. And he had a passionate fan base, you know, in that old, that old rickety stadium that was putting 78000 in there on a Sunday afternoon. But he, you know, he just had no penchant for being able to control his money so those were two free agent stories one that he didn't get <laughs> but he ended up buying two beautiful leather great jackets. coats great coats <laughs> which was perfect for what for green bay for green bay weather <laughs> do they have browns inscribed no on them? They no no, like he didn't, yeah. no they were like just really like yeah, bo- beautiful leather jackets i remember seeing them you know <laughs> My great goodness. stories that is yeah that is quite great the league is slightly different now <laughs> a little bit that you know, you speak about how that, like Reggie went on that tour, and I'll never. There was a Sports Illustrated cover with him in the front of it, and then a bunch of jerseys yeah. around, and the Browns yeah. were one of the jerseys, yeah. and the Eagles and the Packers. I forget who else was in the mix. Might have been Washington. Can't remember. Um, but I remember that vividly. And it, I and to kind of bring that whole full circle when you said about going on the tour. Remember when Urban got the job in Jacksonville? Mm. He thought free agents would come in and he could recruit them. Yeah. And they had to be like, oh no 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 no. And he's like, well, what do you mean? They sign and they don't come and visit us? They're like, yeah. Yeah. They'd agree to terms without visiting. Yeah. It's the NFL. That's the way that it is. That's I, how much it's changed in 30 years. Yeah. Obviously, he had great difficulty in converting yeah. into the pro game. But you know who else did? I have to tell you, Butch Davis had a lot of trouble doing that. We used to do a show with him on Monday nights. People might remember it. We, just down the street here, there was a steakhouse called Damon's. Yeah. Okay. And we used to do the show there live Monday nights. And when he would come in, he would the the thing that bugged him the most, Bo, was number one. He was watching my his Miami Hurricanes just roll over people on Saturdays, yeah. and then his Browns team get rolled over on Sunday. But by Monday, he would always say he could never understand 
Why do I am? Why can't I only dress a certain amount of players? Mm-hmm. Why can Jimmy? Why can I only dress a certain amount of players on Sunday? I mean, we have them all under contract. I mean, shoot, at a home game at the Orange Bowl, we could run, run out as many as we had uniforms for. Right. And he just could couldn't not. Yeah, he couldn't convert from the uh, college game. Did he have? Um, you know, for the for the people out there who don't recall, I, the younger audience. He had resurrected Miami the second time. Oh, yeah. So Jimmy Howard and Jimmy did it. Yep. Dennis Erickson, then it fell off a cliff, and then he got it and resurrected it. And then he set the table for, I think, the most talented college football team of all time. Unbelievable. In the, in the early 2000s yeah. with Miami. Did he ever have regret or the checks cashed and he's good? Because I think um, he could, I think he the che- I, think the, I think the checks cashed and he was, he was good with it. Um, I think the, the, um, the difficult thing for him – was that he couldn't get the Miami players here when he wanted to get them in the draft. He ended up getting Winslow, uh, yeah. of course. Yeah. But the the guy he really wanted that year, he wanted Sean Taylor. Mm-hmm. And Sean Taylor was gone then to Washington. Yep. And then he took Winslow. But when he saw people like uh, Dan Morgan and and the big offensive, Mount McKinley, remember sure. the le- big left tackle? Yeah, Brian McKinney. Yeah, yeah. Brian, when, he, when he saw those players going off the board and he couldn't get them – and recruit them, okay? He he just couldn't get over that. You know that was the that was the unfairness he thought of the NFL. I mean, these players love me. Why yes. why can't I just get them? You know, yeah. well, there's a pecking order. That's here. the way it goes. Yeah, that's the yeah. way it goes. The, yeah, maybe you can get one of them. Didn't and the crazy thing was, didn't they took William Green and because Portis was on the board, wasn't he? He was in that yeah, draft, so yeah. they could have taken Portis. Yeah, I think I think William Green went like 16th or 17th. And Portis that year was with a them. second round pick, I believe. Remember he was, he yeah, yeah. and he was a stud. Yeah, yeah. So no, that was always Urban's thing. He's like, I, I knew it, you knew it was going to be a miss right away because it's like, I wait a second, I can't buy my own groceries. It's the old Bill Parcells. Yeah, in college football, you can buy your own groceries if you can recruit it. You can get who you want. You could trace Butch Davis's drafting record because I mean, Pete Garcia was here, but basically Butch was, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, he was handpicked to come from Miami with Butch. Yeah. So anyway, you could trace what Butch, uh, Butch was going to do in the draft. Either he tried to get one of his players from Miami or he got a player that he recruited that didn't go to Miami but competed against him. And it was, you know, really, if you took a look at the biography, you so would always say. Boston College, William yeah. Green. It was Jeff Fain at Jeff Notre Fain Dame. At but Notre he, Dame. It, it, what was Jeff's second choice? Miami. Miami. Yeah. And so, so his kids he knew. Yeah. McCown's brother, the quarterback. Luke. Oh, Luke. Yeah, 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 yeah. He drafted him because he had a heck of a game against him. When he was at Miami, was he at Louisiana Tech? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. And yeah. that was his pattern, Bo. It was unbelievable watching yeah. it. Gerard Warren. He recruited Gerard Warren, thought he had him. He ended up being a Gator. He went to Florida. But that was his. That was the way he did it. Could have had Richard Seymour. That's right. You know, the, the, the Georgia. The, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, the crazy <laughs> thing is if he could have – I used to do a thing around here like in the early 2010s, like if the Browns just took best available Buckeye a lot of those years, they would have been – gold yeah he could have just taken best available hurricane oh absolutely and they would have been yeah. gold because yeah. those teams were just stacked remember that would drive browns fans crazy that they would not select buckeye players right <laughs> right <laughs> well and the ones that they did yeah i mean like rubisky was fine but he wasn't yeah, i know but you know they just, just boy, he, he wa- wasn't a second he rounder. was not the kid that you saw no you know in the he, jim trestle troy smith no. offense with gonzalez and all those players he just didn't have that separation yeah the yeah, way that yeah. the way that some of those other guys did um all right free agency is upon us we'll go over some of the very latest news some of the news from over the weekend as well uh we'll get you set on where we are some quarterbacks i want to get into that Kirk cousin situation because it speaking of buckeyes justin fields appears to be going nowhere at the moment wow. and i think you're almost like that's it's amazing. like the game like the 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 game where you get up and you run around, everybody's got to have a seat yeah. that you used to play as a kid. Yeah. There might not be any seats for <laughs> Justin Fields. We'll get into that coming up next. Cleveland Browns Daily 850 ESPN Cleveland.
All right, be part of one of the most passionate fan base of the NFL. Join Next Gen STM, presented by Ticketmaster. Official wait list here, Cleveland Browns being a Next Gen STM. Best chance to become a season ticket member in future seasons. Visit clevelandbrowns.com slash STM to reserve your spot today. We did have a little bit of quarterback news. We mentioned the Baker deal, three years, $100 million deal in Tampa, $50 million of that guaranteed for our former quarterback. Um, there was a, a trade over the weekend of another first-round pick, the Patriots and Jaguars finalizing a deal. It's going to send Mac Jones to Jacksonville for a sixth-round wow. pick. He was a first-round pick three years ago. He, yeah, and his first here. his first year. I mean, he won the national title mm-hmm. uh, for Alabama. Was that against Ohio State? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In okay. the in the uh, COVID year, COVID twenty. Year, yeah. yeah. So he won the he came in the his rookie year, and they made the playoffs. Now mm-hmm. he. He stuttered late in the year, and they got murdered in the playoff game in Buffalo. Then the, after that, it got really funky there, and there was a real disconnect between Bill Belichick and him. And then remember what they did offensively when Josh McDaniels left. Yeah. They had uh, the two defensive guys. Matt Patricia became the offensive <laughs> That's coordinator. That's right, yeah. and Joe Judge. Yeah. Um, and the kid really got fouled up then. And then this year was just a disaster all the way through. Yes. And he wasn't uh, playing at the end of the year, so. But I thought maybe if Belichick, with Belichick leaving, he might get uh, a second chance with Gerard Mayo as the head coach, and, and of course our guy going in, Alex Van Pelt, is the offensive coordinator. So I don't know. They have to draft a quarterback now. Uh, well, yeah, I would think, and I, you know, it makes you think like. The, I saw over the weekend that maybe uh, Brissett would go there mm. and they'll draft a quarterback at two. Yeah. I forget it. Are they picking two in Washington, three, or is it inverted? New England is three. three. New England's three. three. All right. Yep. So it'll go It'll go Caleb Williams, and then Washington will pick who they want, and then New England will pick third. Now, back there in New England, um, there's like a heavy push to get a quarterback, uh, a veteran quarterback, and draft Marvin Harrison Jr. So that's something that – that I said I proposed this to Z last week. Once we started, and we'll get to Cousins in a second. But once it appeared that Atlanta was not going Cousins' way, and we figured that out at the combine, uh, that that wasn't the way that they were going to go. So once that started to happen, I said, "Boy, if you're New England, and you're not, am I sure about Jaden Daniels? I, I don't yeah. know. Am I sure about Drake May? I don't know. Yeah. Like, am I? What happens if you give up now? A th- maybe now it's a fourth round pick for Justin Fields." You bring in Fields, and then you draft Harrison three. Now you got Fields at quarterback, Harrison at receiver. That's a pretty big yeah. injection of talent right. right away. Yeah. And you know Fields can play. It's not like he can't play. Like he's a different type of quarterback, obviously. But um, I think AVP could work with him, and he makes it, he can throw the deep ball, and he certainly is very dangerous with, the, with his legs. Right. Uh, but I don't know. Is that something that would pass the test there? Well, I know that that there's there's been a great feeling back there of hey let's get let's get this guy Marvin Harrison Jr. Gosh, I mean who wouldn't mm-hmm. want him, right? I mean yeah. he is just ready made. He is ready to He's play ready right to away. He's NFL ready. Um, but I don't it, this move over the weekend, the Mac Jones situation. I mean leaves them. They are really empty at quarterback. I mean Bailey Zappi. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean they had cut him. Mm-hmm at the start of the season and then brought him back on the practice squad. And then at the end of the year, he was playing. Yeah. When they lost in Germany, they played that Germany game. And, that. and yeah. uh, they, they just – Mac Jones was terrible. They brought Zappi in. He threw a horrible pick right at the end of the game. And, uh, you know, their quarterback situation was just dismal. Isn't it something how quickly they know? I know. I mean, They yeah. come off of quarterbacks, Jim. Yeah. I mean, you used to be – if you were a first-round pick, you got – three to four years right. to figure it out. Sure. I mean, now, like Fields, Mac, Mariota, so many of these guys don't – there's so many guys – Rosen. In the, Rosen, Darnold. Darnold, yeah. Wilson with the Jets. Sure. There's there's a half dozen off the top of the head without any sort of giving it much thought right. that did not – not only didn't get to a second contract, didn't get to a fifth-year option, and were jettisoned. Right. They are – this league, they're making quick decisions on if a guy can play or not. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, Bo, that they don't wait anymore to play a kid, typically. No. I mean, uh, I mean, remember, the, the plan here was that Mayfield was going to sit that entire year, Taylor was going to play, Baker was going to kind of watch it, and then, you know, you you could see that you had to get Mayfield in yeah. and get him to play. But, I mean, the, the, the sitting around now, it, it doesn't happen now. You have to you, – you need instant – Instant intelligence and performance from these kids that come in at quarterback, and they need to go right away. And you're right. Then the decision is made pretty quickly if it's going to go badly. 
Well, look at these two kids we're talking about, whether it be Mac. I mean, that's a pretty bad spot he's put in there. Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of weapons. Uh, as you mentioned, two defensive guys calling his plays in year two after McDaniels left. Mm -hmm. uh, Fields has had three different offenses in his early career right. with the Bears. They had next to no weapons. And the worst there. game plan I have ever seen in oh. his first start here with Matt Nagy, which was shocking because Matt Nagy right out of the Kansas City system and offense. I could, I've could. i said this before on the show, so I'm not reinventing the wheel with this. It almost felt like it was proving a point. Like Nagy was proving a point. Like, you're going to make me play this kid. You watch yeah, what happens. that's a good point. That's yeah, what it almost felt point. like. Yeah. It felt like malfeasance. Like th that he was putting him out there to fail because you with what he is to make him stand in there and just get bludgeoned by miles over and over and over again. Like four was, and a half times. Wasn't it, it was awful. Yeah. yeah he's, well, he broke he the went record. down like eight or nine times in the game. Yeah. He yeah. just was hit constantly. Yeah. Um, but here's the reality on Justin Fields. And while maybe that part of it is all true, it also could be true that I was dead wrong about this. I thought that there would be a decent market for him. I did too. It appears to me, Jim, that if he starts next year, the only other place other than the – and we'll get to Cousins in a second. The only place I can – I went through the whole league. The only place I can think of is the Raiders. Hmm. There's not another yeah. spot yeah. out there. You start going through the divisions. If if New England is going to go young and like a Brissett type, which it feels like that's kind of where they're going to go, mm -hmm. there's nothing in the NFC East. The AFC North is full. The AFC South is full. Yeah. The AFC West – it's Raiders. I don't. He's not a fit for Sean Payton with Denver. No, that's not what he wants. Right. So the Raiders are out there. In the NFC, Washington seems intent on taking a quarterback. There's nobody else in the East. They're mm. all locked in. I assume Dan Jones stays in the Giants. The NFC South now. If Cousins goes to Atlanta, which it looks like that's going to happen, Baker's back in Tampa. There will be a job in Minnesota, but Chicago's not going to trade him in the, within yeah, the division. Within the division, right, yeah. So there's nothing there. And then the NFC West, all those teams are locked up. Right. So yeah. is it possible that he's not going to start next year? Kind of seems it like that's where we're headed. Yeah. And I have to tell you, that he is captivating, though. I, I agree. I, I watched him even against us late in the year. And, he, you know, that was a – he gave the Browns fits that day. Um, and especially, you know, that last play when he's running around, he's heaving it down into the end zone. But his, I, I think that uh, I just look at him in that athleticism yeah. that he has. He's got a great arm, and I think he's, you know, he's just been beaten up. Yeah. That is a case where where there's a lot of change. It really hurts a kid like that. Yeah. You know, they just get beaten up, and they get beaten up mentally, and then that overtakes what they can do physically. Yes. You know, they just no. lose it all. It's it's something That's too that, bad. It's probably something similar. It's funny. I was just having this conversation about Tim Couch over the weekend as an example oh. of a guy who oh. who knows what happened. Like, just do the swap and say he goes to Philly and plays with those Andy Reid teams and McNabb oh. is here yeah. and McNabb endures everything that Couch endured early on in his career here and Couch got to play in Philly with Andy Reid in that offense in an established unit. You were here for that. Oh, it was unbelievable. It was bludgeoned. He never should have gone in as quickly as they put him in. The plan was that Ty Detmer was going to quarterback them. Detmer had a rough opening game against Pittsburgh, and Couch finished the game, but, I mean, it was 43 nothing. And they went to Tennessee the next week, Bo, and they put him in there, and it was, you know, I don't know if Jim Schwartz was there at that point, but that Tennessee defense, Javon Kurse mm -hmm. was there. I mean, they, they were loaded. I mean, they eventually yeah. went to a Super Bowl. Um and he just got killed in that first game. And then it just kept happening, you know. And then there were times that he was brilliant. I mean, yes. Couch, Couch could be great. He went over to Heinz Field and won on a Sunday night over there and was just tremendous. He looked like, you know, he, he was mm -hmm. great. I mean, he was phenomenal. But he just physically and mentally just got beaten up. I mean, the worst time was one time it was – I think it was against the Ravens. It was a night game, Monday night game probably. And he got knocked out of the game with a concussion mm -hmm. and – there was kind of a cheer when he was mm. leaving, and he broke down in the locker room, you know, t in front of the media after the game about, you know, how he was being treated. And that was watching a kid just come unglued. That was too bad. Yeah. That's, You're we, right, though. That's a good thought. If he had gone to Philadelphia, yeah. you know, what would have happened have, there? You have that infrastructure. You sure. Have, you, you put – you got you draft a guy first overall, and I wasn't here at that time, obviously, but just the notion of you're an expansion team. You draft this – I mean, if, if 
if the Lord was creating the perfect looking quarterback, it's Tim Couch. Right. Right. He's coming from the Southern School, Kentucky, King of Kentucky, all of those things. He comes in here, he looks the part. You have an expansion team. You're trying to have some excitement because there's a business to this. Right. And that's the other thing that happens. That's what happened to Justin in Chicago. That happened to David Carr uh, oh, yeah. in, sure. in Houston uh, when they drafted him number one overall. And you get in and you're forced to play and then you just get bludgeoned. And I always give Baker a lot of credit for this because he didn't get broken by – because this is a lot. He was dealt early here. Mm-hmm. The team was much better. But the, he was dealt with a lot. And if you can survive it, and I think that will be the test for a guy like Fields. Can you survive – all of the things that went wrong early in your career to get through to the other side yeah, of it. Get a clean slate. Because oftentimes else. they can't. Yeah. You know, yeah, they can't right. do it. Yeah. We do have uh, what looks to be official here now. Well, not official, but it's getting close. Uh, Cousins going to get a four-year deal in Atlanta. Wow. Boy, I'll tell you what. He has made <laughs> a boatload of money, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Um, and he's used it. He's used the tag very well. I mean, he's taken, you know, and and ended up with a high salary on that. But I have to tell you, for a guy that has never really been in a big game, Mm -hmm. nor won a big game, he commands a great deal of money. Why do you think that is? I think because... I mean, can you remember? Other than when he he ended up kind of RG3, got hurt, and he got the Redskins into the playoffs... And, you know, he, he played very well, but then they got knocked right out mm-hmm. after that. Um, no, I think that it was all hatched here in, in, on, a, on a Sunday here. R- yeah, RG3 got hurt. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he hurt his knee, and the Browns were kind of semi in it, and Washington definitely was in it over on the NFC side. And it was Mike Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan, and they brought and they played him. We found out Sunday morning that RG3 wasn't going to play, kind of like the. Yeah, the Watson deal against Baltimore sure. this year. So Cousins goes out, and Bo, they run a bootleg rollout that he kept throwing to the tight end. <laughs> they must have run it 25 times, and 25 times it was complete and went for big plays, and the Browns could not stop it. They just could not stop it, and he ended up winning that game, and that kind of launched him a little bit. Here's my theory on Cousins. <laughs> That's amazing. This is my theory on it. I think there are so many of the – you mentioned the Shanahans. There are so many of those coaches in the league. We got one here. Yes, we and, do. And what they want is for you to throw it to the guy who is open. Simple. Yeah. yeah that seems so simple. It does. But it's schemed. There, There's a play that is set up that is schemed. And if they want you to throw it exactly where they want you to throw it. They don't want improv- improvisational – I, that's why, and and Purdy's far more than this, but mm-hmm, that's yeah. why that's why Kyle likes Brock Purdy more than he was ever going to like Trey Lance. It's why he probably liked, really considered Mac Jones in the draft more than he ever would have considered Justin Fields, because yeah. what he wants is your back is to you need to trust me, so mm-hmm. that re- creates trust, right? Yeah, right. You're going to turn your back to the defense. This is going to look exactly like the last 16 wide zone runs, and now you're going to keep it. You're going to whip your head around. There's going to be a guy open here, yeah. and I need you to throw that's it. That's right. Yeah. And I think Cousins does that. Yeah. And I um, think that's why this has happened. Is the it's the Shanahan tree. It's Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota's running that now with O'Connell. Like it's the same type of stuff. They're going to run that down in in Atlanta. In fact, when we were at the comment, I was talking to Chris Rose after Z left. And Chris and I were talking, and I said, I go, doesn't Fields feel like Atlanta? That feels like the spot. Like, Z and I have been talking about that for two years. Like, goes back to Georgia, right. like yeah. all that young yeah, talent. Like, right. he thrive, uh, his home state. And he said, no, who's the offensive coordinator there? It's Zach Robinson. Well, Zach came in under Sean McVay. What is Sean McVay's favorite person he's ever had a quarterback? Matt Stafford. Why? He throws it where it's supposed to be thrown, and he's accurate. Yeah. And that's what Cousins is. Yeah. He's really accurate. You know, it's really amazing. Uh, the good coaches – like you were mentioning there, they they get their quarterbacks to an automatic good start with an automatic play. Yep. When Kevin had Mayfield here, it was always a slant to Landry. Yep. Right away. Right away. Okay, get it going. Okay. Um, this year, it was um, you know no matter who it was, Watson or any of the five, right, <laughs> any of the five that ended right. up playing Flacco the same way. It would be a quick. It would be a six yard throw to Injoku. Mm -hmm. to get you into a nice second down, three, Mm -hmm. four. And Shanahan was brilliant at that. Yes. And, you know, Brian Hoyer had a great year that year Mm -hmm. with Shanahan here, um, and it was because of the running game set up just wide open throws. Yes. And there there it is. 
No, it's it. That's it. So for, for what, what he does in Atlanta, what Cousins does in Atlanta, is to me he makes them the best team in the NFC South. Um, they'll win. That's an organization that is starving for any oh, sort of success. We're so close. Right. Yeah. And, and Arthur Blank is striving for, thriving for, just starving for any type of success. They've got a ton of talent everywhere else, really good young defense, incredible weaponry. And now you have a guy who will throw it where it's supposed to go. He's going to complete 70% of his passes. You know, where you go. There you go. Yeah. So um, to me, this make now, I don't know what our guy Quasi Adolfo Mentz is going to do in Minnesota now. I know. Yeah. So I don't know who's even the quarterbacks on their roster. Um, they had a kid from BYU who they played at the end of the year. That's right. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they, I can't played, remember how that I think well. he played. No, it didn't go well. He played against Green Bay, I remember, on a Sunday night game, and he got the start. It was after the whole Dobbs. Okay. Situation. Oh yeah, because Josh played well over there. Yeah, and uh, and who was the uh, Nick Mullins? Nick was Mullins there was over there. over there for a yeah. while. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I was just. I think he was at BYU. That whoever this I, kid was. That's Jaren straight. Hall is his name. Jaren Hall. Am I right BYU. that he was at BYU? Yeah. 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 He had a terrible Sunday night game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he did. That was not particularly good. Not for very him. good. Yeah. Kirk Cousins is thirty six. Wow. And he got a four year deal. Now who knows what's guaranteed of it, but it's a four year deal. Is, is what Great guy, though, isn't he? I mean, seems, seems like, like a, it seems like a really terrific guy. I know he did that in 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 Minnesota. They yeah. really there was a huge contingent of people that really liked him. His teammates liked him. I know that he and Justin Jefferson would disagree, but that happens with a big time receiver. Well, and that, I mean, it happened in Pittsburgh for sure. It happened uh, in Buffalo, you know, with Stephon Diggs. I I would think press to answer the question correctly. Kevin would probably say that. Diggs did the same thing when he was in Minnesota, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. That and it happens. It, it happens. I think the bigger thing for Minnesota going forward is Justin Jefferson needs a contract. Right, he's due. Yeah. If you're Justin Jefferson, are you signing a contract in Minnesota, not knowing who's throwing you the football? And see, that's the big thing. Yeah. So, like you, the feeling I got last week at the combine was that they would, that they wanted to bring him back, bring Cousins back because they've got other. They got other mouths to feed, and they got mm-hmm. these young guys. And Quasi even said, like he's a like he's a blue chip, like in in Jefferson. Like you can't, we can't be like a feeder system for everybody else, mm-hmm. you yeah. know. And so, like if he doesn't know who's throwing it to him, isn't it funny, Bo? No, whether it's a guy looking for a coaching job in the NFL yes. or now any player in the NFL, when mm-hmm. they look at teams. Who's the quarterback there? Yeah. Right? I mean, if you're going to be a coach going into a situation, that's why people, you know, said going into Carolina right now with Bryce Young there, yep. you don't know, right? You no. know, You really don't know. But if you go into it with a team that has a – well, first of all, maybe a, it's the job isn't open if the quarterback's really good for a head coach. <laughs> yeah. You'd have to really screw it up, right? You would. <laughs> <laughs> but usually that's what that, a player will definitely look. Yes. At, and certainly a receiver. Who's going to be throwing it to me? Kirk Cousins' career earnings, $231 million. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, we had some interesting news on the stadium side of things over in Chicago. want to get to that story coming up next. Keep you updated on free agency. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Passionate fan base is the NFL. Join Next Gen STM presented by Ticketmaster, your official wait list of your Cleveland Browns. Being a Next Gen STM, the best chance to become a season ticket member in future seasons. Visit clevelandbrowns.com slash STM to reserve your spot today. Uh, I saw this over the weekend uh, out of Chicago, uh, a major shift in the Bears. So they yeah. had bought, uh, I want to say it's a former Arlington Heights race track out yeah. in Arlington in the suburbs. It's like 364 acres. Yeah. And and then uh, there were some tax issues that hit them and that the realities of that and they were kind of being scrambling, but they were moving out of downtown Chicago. Huge shift over the weekend. Many people reporting this among them, our friend of the program, Courtney Cronin, um, <laughs> that the Bears plan to build a new stadium while remaining in Chicago. Mm. The franchise is going to pay two billion dollars of their money to help fund a publicly owned stadium, domed stadium. Wow. First time they've done that. Um, so it's south of Soldier Field. I, I've been to Chicago, Chicago a handful of times. Is that like on the way towards like the museums, Jimmy? Do you have a better handle well, on it than um, I do? Maybe. Well, the museums are right there with Soldier Field, so they're all right there. Yeah, I mean, okay. right. So there. They, it's, it's almost like it's almost like the Science Center and I Rock you. Hall here. Okay, it's that close. Okay, yeah. so that's but it's got to be right in that area yeah, in somewhere that, in that Grant Park area. I would, would think. Yeah, yeah, I would think. I would again. I don't know the geography. I apologize, folks. I don't don't know Chicago geography that well. Um, but they are going to play, continue out in Soldier Field until this gets built. And then they will tear down the spaceship they built inside of old Soldier <laughs> Field. On, that is the worst. <laughs> How did they get that so wrong? I have no idea. A city known but, for its architecture. Do you realize uh, the radio booth, you cannot see the ball in the air because the deck comes down over the over the front of oh, the, the booth. the overhang. Yeah, the overhang. <laughs> oh, my god! So they yeah. put a television screen on the on the ed, on the uh, facade of the overhang and so when there's a punt or a field goal or anything like that oh, you can't see it you don't know where, or a, or a high arching pass <laughs> it's it was amazing but spaceship is the right way to identify that Strange. and that was a historic yeah. i mean they maintained the those pillars mm -hmm. but barely yeah okay cuz they yeah i haven't i and was at they the kinda, old soldier and then they inserted this really stadium like you said kind of this dish Mm -hmm. like spacecraft in inside of it it was just a bizarre way such to a, do it such a choice and they kept saying well we preserved the history no you really didn't <laughs> you really other don't. than i feel like i'm on an episode of the jetsons that's it man. <laughs> that's that crazy. was it <laughs> yeah they really botched it um <laughs> the thing that is amazing though is like chicago has never this is a you know one of the major cities in, in the united states obviously with a dome they're going to get super bowls they're going to get Final oh, Fours. Yeah, sure. They're going to get Big Ten Championship yeah. football games. They're going to get college football playoff games. They're going to get WrestleManias. Like, all of the things that Chicago hasn't been able to do because they haven't had a venue. Right. Now you're back in business, baby. Absolutely. I and mean, you're Absolutely. going to get all those things. Yeah. I mean, they've been playing – you think about the Big Ten football championship game in Indy yeah. for all these years. That's going to move up to Chicago sometimes. They're at least going to rotate that around. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll go west a little bit too. Um, maybe they play it in the Rose Bowl or Vegas a little bit, but they're going to definitely. But you're go right. West. You're t you're talking Final Four. You're talking yeah. you know all kinds of events. Chicago's never had any of that. No. no. So and that'd be a fun right. town to go to to for a Super Bowl too. For I mean, sure, Chicago's a great town. It's an awesome city, and you you now you have now you're going to build a dome there. So. We've had two new stadiums. Now, this one's not announced in that way. This is basically just a shift back to city. Um, but you have the Buffalo Stadium that's being done, and that's not going to have a dome. And there's a ton of public money in that one. Mm -hmm. um, but they're not going to go a dome in Buffalo. Um, Minnesota did a dome, and it's spectacular. Tremendous. That's the best. Oh, one. what a beautiful place. Is that your favorite? It, of the new places, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That, I, the day we went in there and they won and it was great too. But I mean, aside from that, I mean, that I, I just couldn't believe where we were. It was fantastic because my first job in radio was in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Okay. 90 miles outside of the Twin Cities. And I used to go to the Met. Sure. The old stadium. You yeah, know, with Metrodome. The with the per no, the oh, outdoor the plate. The, the oh, Met. oh, the Met. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't have a point on that. <laughs> oh, I had my. Metrodome for you. Unbelievable. Yeah. Where Bud Grant would show up just before the game, and you say, gosh, he's the head coach of the Vikings. What's he doing? He was out duck hunting oh, my on God. a Sunday morning. Of course. It was amazing. That's What a life. <laughs> That's fantastic. Still the coldest I've ever been oh. at a football game was – Ohio State in 2014 played up at Minnesota outdoors. Oh yeah, in December in their new stadium, in their new one. Yeah, they have that. Yeah, new stadium. and it was 14 below air temp. That's the coldest really? I've Oof. been. But you guys, there was one that one at Christmas. Was, oh, that Christmas Eve game against the Saints. That was, was brutal. And it was a crazy. Thursday night game against Pittsburgh. 
that Josh Cribbs ended up single-handedly winning mm-hmm. for the Bronze, and that was bitter cold. Yeah, it's there's no fun in it, right. kids. Uh, we'll get your Griff fact of the day and so much more to come. You'll listen to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland. All right, give me the griff. Give me the griff. What do we got? Uh, Draymond Green has made more three-pointers in his career than Larry Bird has <laughs> in 253 less games. Oh my People God. can't wrap their head around the fact no. that they didn't shoot threes in those days. Yeah, that's they right. Didn't. They oh tried to go God. to the rim. That, yeah, it that, was crazy when we were looking at that. Like yeah. We think of Bird as such a good shooter. And he was. He just didn't take that many. That's no, sacrilegious. They just shoot him. It is. <laughs> it's funny. I just popped up on one of my social channels. Ten years ago today, I was at the Big Ten Championship game in Indy, yeah. and it was Ohio State basketball against Michigan State and Draymond Green. Wow. So it's interesting that you guys yeah. had that as your griff fact of the day. This has been a great pleasure, sir. Hey, I, I, I had a ball. That's two hours that whipped by. It's, it's flying, buddy. <laughs> Always does when you're here. The great voice, Jim Donovan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next level is coming up next. Thanks for listening, everybody. Cleveland Browns Daily, 850 ESPN Cleveland.